Good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Halloran, the, the provost at William & Mary, and it's my great pleasure to see so many of you here this evening and to welcome you to tonight's 13th TAC Faculty Lecture. The TAC Faculty Lecture is endowed through a generous uh, contribution by Carl and Martha Tack, both of the class of 78. And it's founded on a very simple premise, that our intellectual energy as a university comes from the creative work of the faculty as they conduct research and lead students in the quest for new knowledge and deeper understanding. That being the case, we should not hide our bright light under a bushel, but rather let it shine brightly. Carl and Martha are not able to be with us this evening, although it's possible that they are streaming this, I'm not sure, uh, but in any case, in absentia, I thank them to tonight's lecture. Elizabeth Losh joined our faculty in 2015 and is an associate professor of English and American studies with a specialty in new media ecologies. She received her bachelor's degree in English from Harvard and her MFA in creative writing and her PhD in English from the University of California, Irvine. Before coming to William & Mary, she directed the culture, art, and technology program at the University of California, San Diego. She's a core member and former co-facilitator of the feminist te technology collective, FemTechNet, which offers a distributed open collaborative course. She's a blogger for Digital Media and Learning Central and part of the international organizing team of this selfie course. She currently also serves on the Executive Council of the Modern Language Association. At William & Mary, she co-directs the Equality Lab, a center for digital scholarship, which recently organized the very successful Race, Memory, and Digital Humanities Symposium with leading scholars from around the country addressing the legacies of slavery and segregation. She teaches courses about electronic literature, digital journalism, game studies, comics and graphic novels, the intersection of gender and computational culture, and the long history of moral panics about new media, te new media technologies, going back to my friends, Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> Professor Losh has been a prolific, versatile, and innovative scholar. She has written numerous essays about communities that produce and consume and circulate online video, video games, digital photography, text postings, and programming code. Much of this work concerns the legitimization of political institutions through visual evidence, representations of war and violence in global news, and discourses about human rights. Professor Losh is also the author of Virtual Politic, an electronic history of government media making in a time of war, scandal, disaster, miscommunication, and mistakes and the war on learning, gaining ground in the digital university, both from MIT Press, and they will be on sale after this evening. She's the co-author with Jonathan Alexander of the comic book textbook, Understanding Rhetoric, a graphic guide to, to writing. And most recently, she has published the co-edited, um, she has published the edited collection called MOOCs and their Afterlives, Experiments in Scale and Access in Higher Education. She also has two forthcoming books, a co-edited volume on feminist digital humanities and a book on hashtag as a cultural object. And her current work is an in-progress uh, study on the ubiquitous computing in the White House in both the Obama and Trump administrations and the role of the smartphone as a kind of historical actor in contemporary politics. Her talk this evening could not be on a more timely or engaging topic. Is there a day, a single day or an hour, that passes without our hearing the term fake news, whether from a POTUS tweet, a newscast, or among our friends, with, I hope, varying degrees of irony? Professor Losh will help us to contextualize and to understand what's at stake in her talk, Fake News for Real People. Liz, come on up. Thank you so much, Provost Halloran, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and of course, thank you to Martha and Carl Tack for the generosity that allows this series to exist. It's opportunities like this for 
meaningful public engagement that are so important for the campus. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces among my faculty colleagues and students and former students. And it's nice to see new faces as well um, from our many alumni, donors, and community members. So I'm delighted to see you this evening. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about fake news for real people. Here at William & Mary, one of the courses I teach is a course on game studies. In addition to teaching about video games for consoles or game apps for smartphones, uh, this course on game studies also talks about traditional games like board games or card games. And we also talk about athletics and team sports. So a few weeks ago, I thought it would be interesting, fun, and maybe thought-provoking to spend a little bit of time playing soccer in the sunken garden nearby. And I thought this would be a very successful activity. I had coordinated it with some reading from the Dutch cultural theorist, Johan Housinga. And it, it really seemed like a good, well-thought-out activity, except the student who was supposed to bring the soccer ball <laughs> neglected to do so. But you know, I'm not someone who abandons a lesson plan too easily. And so we went out into the sunken garden to the mystification of passers-by. And we played soccer for a few minutes to discuss its play principles without a ball. And therefore, when a few days later, this story appeared in my social network feed, I was certainly entertained and informed. Okay, you got to go, let's go, let's go. Hustle up, you guys, just take a knee. Let's take a knee real quick, take a knee. All right. Everyone's doing their ankle. Everyone's got the ankle. Twists, let's do some twists. Let's go, yeah. Get ready for those headers, right? Okay, you guys ready for a good game today? Yeah. yeah. All right, you all warmed up? Yes. Yeah. Next. That's a nice goal. Let's get that out. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Here in Olympia, we've been looking at how competition impacts youth, and it's usually kind of negative, especially if you're on the losing team. So last year, we took away the notion of scoring, which meant there were no winners and there were no losers. But in many ways, we felt like it just didn't go far enough. So we've actually taken away the ball. Throw in. Here we go. Throw in. Who's got it? Who's got it? There we go. There we go. There we go. Here, ball's here. OK. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Ball's here. Ball's here. Ball's here. Balls there, balls there, balls there. Okay, good, good, good. All right, great, great. Good job, you guys. Coaching ballless soccer is very difficult uh, well, from my perspective because I have to do a lot of imagining. I got the ball. Here it comes. Ready? Here you go. You go first. Here we go. Here we go. Stephanie. Anna. All right, we'll get this going. Here you are. I got it. Good. Yeah, any coach can coach a kid on uh, soccer skills and having fun out there. But uh, the real challenge of my job as a coach in ball of soccer is uh, trying to keep track of where the ball is and, and coach the kids on how do you keep track of the ball and where is the ball. Kevin, what's going on? You look confused. I don't know where the ball is. We've been over this. Melissa obviously has the ball. Look it. Remember what I said? You see it here, you'll see it there, right? You see it here, you see it there. And there's the ball right there. You got this? Got go get the ball, Kev. Let's go. Let's go. Back at it. Hey, whoa. You saw that, right? Yeah. There you go, you. OK. <laughs> so as many of you obviously figured out based on your laughter, this is a parody story. This is intended to be satiric. This is making fun of overcoddling of young people. However, not everyone realized it was a parody story. And in fact, the opposingviews.com website covered it with considerable outrage. And it, that was also picked up by the Washington Times. Now, you can sort of understand why some people might have thought a fake news story like this was a real one, because the actors are performing their roles in a certain deadpan style. And it was posted on the website for the Canadian Broadcast Company. And so it's true that the CBC produces news programming as a network, but they also produce entertainment and comedy shows as well. Now, my 
friends who spread the Bala soccer story knew it was a joke. But I've also had friends share fake news stories on social network sites where they didn't realize that what they were spreading was fake news. So I actually saw this story multiple times in my social network feed. It seems to report information from an interview given by Donald Trump to People magazine in which he expresses contempt for the Republican Party and disregard for the wisdom of the American people. It's not a true story. It's a fake news story but it's one that seemed appealing to people who wanted to believe it of Trump. And fake news can even come closer to home than that. <laughs> and I would like to thank my, my, the person who is going to be the butt of this joke for being here. But I came home to my house in Colonial Williamsburg and discovered all these packages of Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> on my kitchen counter. Now, I study fake news, and my spouse had fallen for a fake news story <laughs> that appeared on a social network site. So I study rhetoric, uh, like Michael, who was talking about Plato and Aristotle. Those are the people that I'm interested in, even though I also study very contemporary digital phenomena. Um, and this is actually me on the right, uh, the cartoon version of me, talking about rhetoric in the form of a comic book. And one of the things that we talk about in Understanding Rhetoric, which I co-wrote with Jonathan Alexander, is that there are ways we can think about the appeals of rhetorical forms of communication that have long histories. And so Plato, uh, Plato's student, Aristotle, argued that there were three main means of persuasion. Uh, he argued that there was ethos, which has to do with the authority or credibility of a speaker or writer. So for example, um, when it comes to giving you medical advice, a doctor has more ethos than a used car salesman. Pathos, according to Aristotle, refers to audience emotion. And that emotion can take many forms. It can take the forms of responses that are melodramatic. It can be justified outrage. Uh, and it can even, as in the case of satiric content, be involved in humor. And finally, there's logos. Logos has to do with the organization, structure, or logic of a given message. Now, many would argue that the problem with fake news is there's too much pathos and not enough ethos, not enough credibility and authority, and not enough logos, not enough logic, uh, structure, and uh, basis in a, a, a substantive truth claims. Now, I think as a rhetorician that we all, always are going to need all three. We always need ethos, logos, and pathos in any effective message. Um, and that's going to be true for traditional news stories as well. So we need to have pathos in journalism. We shouldn't be afraid of pathos. But we just need to have uh, ethos and logos as well. And when we think about the ecology of fake news, what we see is many different kinds of audiences and many different kinds of purposes. So there can be fake news stories that are satiric. There are fake news stories that are conspiratorial. There are fake news stories that are clearly partisan. And there are fake news stories that are clickbait. <coughs> But what we can do when we want to untangle this complex media ecology is we can start with a few simple premises. And the first premise that I think it's important to start with is that fake news is not a purely partisan issue. It's true that we've had more conversations about fake news in connection to the rise of the alt-right. But as in the case of the Trump People magazine story, um, left-wing liberal Democrats can spread fake news as well. And demonizing political conservatives is not moving our political conversation on fake news further in any case. The second premise that I hope you all can join me in, in assuming 
is that fake news may have purposes <coughs> other than deception. So in the case of the Bala soccer story, that story isn't intended to deceive people maliciously. It's intended to make people laugh. And I think having that understanding that there can be purposes other than deception for fake news helps us untangle its meaning. And finally, as in the case of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, close at home, the problem isn't just fake news. The problem is that we are living through times in which it's very difficult to ascertain truth. And the supposed uh, verification properties of the internet are not making that truth uh, ascertainment any simpler. Now, the fake news as a term goes back quite a while. Um, it was a term that was used during World War II. Uh, you can find it used quite frequently in the New York Times during the 40s. Um, but even before that, there were anxieties about radio as a media technology in which fake news uh, scandals became part of the public conversation. So Orson Welles, with his famed War of the Worlds broadcast, created widespread hysteria. Um, people who listened to these seemingly authentic news bulletins about uh, America under attack believed that it was true. They believed that the country was being invaded. And hundreds of people wrote afterwards to the FCC, the Federal Com uh, Communication Commission, calling for greater regulation of radio, based on the argument that it could spread fake news. And in fact, before the War of the Worlds broadcast, as scholars have pointed out, there had actually been other fake news stories using the news bulletin format uh, with the radio that had caused confusion. So radio as a new media technology created its own fake news panic. And even before that, the humanists in the audience will appreciate this, if we think about the printing press as a media technology, the printing press has been important for establishing certain forms of scientific truth. It's spread important ideas, but it's also been a technology that has spread fake news. We think about the 15th century and publications of astrological manuals. There were actually widespread panics in European cities caused by the assumption that there was going to be widespread flooding caused by the conjunction of particular stars. And so panicked European citizens actually built elaborate barricades to protect themselves against a deluge that never came. Now in our own era, with computational media and more sophisticated technologies, what kinds of fake news might we experience? Well, we can think about this in the most dystopian possible way. And so I'd like you to watch a little bit of this video that was created by researchers at the University of Washington to think how far fake news could really go. Given this audio as input. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. Our method produces the following output. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Here's the ground truth video of Obama saying the same words. Especially our friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I visited with the families of many of the victims on Thursday. And one thing I told them is that they're not alone. The American people and people all over the world are standing with them, and we always will. So when you look at that clip, what you're seeing on the left is a representation. The media technology of the camera recorded an actual event of a real Obama giving a real speech. The video that you're looking at on the right was generated using sophisticated algorithms that match Obama's enunciation, gestures, expressions, that use computer animation, 3D computer animation, drawing from a database of previous clips of Obama giving his weekly addresses, 
in order to manufacture something that never happened. The French philosopher Jean Baudrillard warned that we might be increasingly likely to live in a world of simulation, what he called a world in which there were copies for which there were no originals. Now that sounds pretty menacing, but I think it's also important to think about how our news consumption has changed just at the level of our everyday experience. During my lifetime, and looking around the room, I can tell during the lifetime of many of you who have uh, some gray hairs as well, um, during my lifetime, I can remember when people started the day with a morning newspaper in print. And that newspaper was usually partially consumed. And then one went about the business of one's day. And then at the end of the day, there might be a nightly news broadcast before going to sleep. But during that intervening time, no news consumption took place. But with the rise of internet browsers and social network sites and news apps for smartphones, why we're consuming news every hour, sometimes every minute. So how has this changed the ways that we're experiencing fake news? Well, I would argue that there have been three different generations of fake news since widespread use of the internet. So I'd say there's fake news 1.0, which is satiric shows, parody shows that seem to make fun of the political the theater of the powerful and privileged and strong. Then you get to fake news 2.0. Fake News 2.0 lacks the jocularity of Fake News 1.0. Instead of a sort of jolly tone of satire, it imagines a dark conspiratorial world, a paranoid world in which information is a weapon and one needs to protect oneself by using information in this negative way. And then we get to our current moment. Fake News 3.0, in which traditional news organizations are mistrusted, are disparaged, and the grounds for truth when it comes to journalistic standards are no longer clear. So let me just sort of walk you through those three different eras. So when you think about the rise of social network sites in the mid-2000s, uh, um, and you think about partnerships between social network sites and traditional legacy media like the New York Times, it's important to remember that fake news also had to think about these sorts of alliances. And indeed, when we think about a show like The Daily Show uh, with Jon Stewart, uh, I hope many of you recognize a William & Mary alum. Uh, a person once described as the most trusted man in fake news. <laughs> um, here he is, of, of course, appearing on Fox News, Fox News in a clip that went viral. Um, but more and more people who were watching shows like The Daily Show or The Colbert Report on Comedy Central didn't watch it on their TV screens, no. They watched it in their social network feeds. Now, what's interesting about fake news 1.0 is it didn't necessarily undermine media literacy. In fact, researchers from the Pew Center found uh, in 2007 quite the opposite. They discovered that people, now granted that this is a demographically screwed, skewed group that tends to be male and younger in the sort of teens to 20s range, but among those Daily Show Colbert Report viewers, they were actually more likely to know uh, political elected representatives, members of the president's cabinet, than people who did not watch shows like The Daily Show or The Colbert Report. And not only did those people perform better on news quizzes than people who didn't watch those shows, they actually performed better than people who watch PBS, a supposedly very neutral very fact-filled show. But not all fake news 1.0 promotes media literacy. It turns out that The Onion, 
And of course, I particularly like this story. Uh, Congress threatens to leave DC unless new capital is built. So legislators are sort of like disgruntled uh, sports teams. Uh, this story was picked up by legitimate news organizations. Now, many of the Onion stories have been picked up by wire services that are foreign wire services, where there's a, a kind of cultural mistranslation effect. But more than a dozen times, Onion stories have been picked up by US news organizations and spread to the US news audiences as true. Why is this the case? Well, researchers in the social sciences have been looking at online news consumption. And an important factor seems to be that people care less and less about the source of a piece of online news and focus more and more on the content of that news. So it's less about context and more about content for those consumers. This really matters when we get to fake news 2.0, which, uh, even though there has been conspiratorial and paranoid fake news for a long time, certainly there was a rash of it during the McCarthy era. After the terrorist attacks of September 11th, there was a spike in internet-related stories that were fake news. And these stories often had a very dark, paranoid, conspiratorial uh, orientation. So for example, um, the film Loose Change, which was initially released for free on the internet, is a, seems to be a, a documentary that raises questions about the September 11th attacks. It suggests that the World Trade Center was brought down by a controlled demolition. It argues that the people on the airplanes must have been actors of some kind because it would be impossible for people to use cell phones to communicate with loved ones from the air. And it generally offers pieces of seeming evidence to sow doubt in the official story of September 11th. This film has been very painful for the surviving families of people who died in September 11th, but it has been watched over a million times. The person who made that film, Dylan Avery, was only in his 20s when he made Loose Change. And today, he certainly expresses a certain amount of regret about it. Um, and I think the particularly regretful part is that, um, so he created Loose Change initially as a fictional story. It was intended to be about um, the idea that uh, a terrorist attack could be a distraction that would allow people to steal a large amount of, in this case, gold. So it was essentially a heist movie. But he thought it would be more, more convincing if he presented it as a documentary. It proved so successful that multiple versions of Loose Change appeared, and some of them were produced by Alex Jones of InfoWars, who then distributed them to his very large audience. Now, Alex Jones of InfoWars uh, argues that there's a deep state that is bent on taking away people's weapons, um, it wants to defang the Second Amendment as a way to put an authoritarian regime in charge. Um, now, what's interesting about this form of fake news 2.0 and its separation from fake news 1.0 is it's actually closer than you might think. Because on Comedy Central now, we have Jordan Klepper's The Opposition, which is fake news 1.0 acting like fake news 2.0. So he's pretending to be a conspiracy theorist, Alex Jones kind of figure. And if that wasn't strange enough, we actually have cases where fake news 2.0 pretends to be fake news 1.0. So this is a screenshot from the last line of defense. And uh, this is a kind of typical story for the last line of defense, breaking first female serial killer in 30 years is a US senator's daughter, and she's a Democrat. Completely untrue, uh, according to Snopes.com and many other sources. But nonetheless, it was shared with tens of thousands of people, perhaps uh, even more. Now, last line of defense, um, thankfully, it's largely defunct now. But if you went to its About Us page, uh, you would read 
We are a group of educated, God-fearing, Christian conservative patriots who are tired of Obama's tyrannical reign and ready to see a strong Republican take the White House. We are sovereign citizens who want our government to keep its nose out of our business. We believe in guns, God, and the Constitution, and will go to any lengths to take our country back from the whiny, politically correct liberal masses. Now, this is kind of familiar rhetoric. It's the kind of thing that you might read if you read Breitbart.com. And I do, because I study the news. Um, and I think it's important to point out that, that Breitbart does sometimes break stories. And there is actual journalism there. Um, and so this seems like this could belong to a news source. However, if you read down to the very bottom of the About Us page, this is what you get. Disclaimer, America's last line of defense is a satirical publication that may sometimes appear to be telling the truth. We assure you that's not the case. We present fiction as fact, and our sources don't actually exist. Names that represent actual people and places are purely coincidental, and all images should be considered altered and do not in any way depict reality. Now, claiming the ground of parody and satire is a brilliant legal strategy because the Supreme Court has affirmed that parody, particularly political satire, is constitutionally protected free speech. Uh, in the Falwell case. And the Supreme Court has even argued that claiming parity can protect you against accusations that you've violated intellectual property law, as in the case of, of Two Live Crew sampling uh, the song Pretty Woman. Um, they argued that it was parody. The Supreme Court agreed, and they didn't have to pay any uh, fines for the royalty violations. Then we get to fake news 3.0 our current era. Uh, many people will doubt the beginning of uh, fake, uh, fake news 3.0 to arguments about the size of the crowds at the Trump inauguration. I mean, to me, the moment when Kellyanne Conway talked about alternative facts was an interesting moment when it comes to thinking about the ecology of fake news. And I, I don't want to be uh, I don't want to demonize the Trump administration. I do not think that is productive for our conversation on fake news. Um, but I do think it's important that there is confusion about what fake news is and that fake news is being used as a term uh, to describe traditional news organizations. And it's understandable why there might be mistrust of traditional journalistic organizations just using traditional journalistic standards. News organizations issue uh, corrections and retractions all the time. I see some people from the flat hat here. Do you guys ever issue corrections and retractions? You know, when you issue a correction or a retraction, you would think that would make a news source more credible because they're doing their due diligence. And yet, for many people, when they see those corrections and retractions, and you see corrections and retractions in the obituaries even, so it's, a, it's certainly something that is, is a part of the news cycle. Um, many people who have cause to doubt traditional journalism doubt it even more when they see those phenomena. So where are we today? Majority of Americans say they're confused about basic facts now. So fake news 3.0 seems to really undermine uh, information literacy in a way that fake news 1.0 never did. We have confusion about chronology. So often there will be a fake news story that's not actually fake, it's just not news. It'll be reporting something that happened 10 years ago or three months ago as though it just happened. You can have other kinds of chronological scrambling too, like the Obama playing golf as president during Katrina story, which if you know your timelines, you know that Obama was not present during Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> you also have geographical scrambling in addition to chronological scrambling. So this story, story about a woman dying in a movie theater uh, takes place in three different geographical places as fake news. You also have um, foreign actors, right? Fake news is becoming a fantastic import into the United States, <laughs> thanks to Russian trolls and Macedonian teenagers and all of these other parties that seem to be spreading fake news. And then we have computers getting into the act, right? This, 
the Center for Computational Propaganda at Oxford University is tracing the role of bots and other kinds of uh, AI algorithms that impersonate real, real people in order to spread fake, fake news. So there are a lot of people generating fake news. But as a recent study uh, published in Science, published this month in fact, indicates between researchers at Northeastern and Harvard universities, uh, the possible explanations for fake news are actually quite close at home. Now they discovered that a fake news story, and this is a scary statistic, is 70% more likely to be retweeted than a real news story. Now researchers hypothesize that part of that re reason has to do with novelty. That if you hear a story that you haven't heard from the mainstream media, you feel like you have inside information and you want to share it with your friends. So there is a kind of logic to that fake news spreading. But it means that we all need to be vigilant rather than assume that fake news is something that's happening somewhere else. In fact, the head of the media manipulation unit at Data and Society herself was notified by Twitter that she had spread at least one fake news story. So I've been working together with Nishant Shah, who's one of the founders of the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India, uh, who's been examining fake news in a variety of country, uh, countries. Uh, Professor Shah has been based in Taiwan, India, uh, Germany. He's currently based in the Netherlands. And working together with a, a transnational perspective, we've been following three trends that might help us better understand why we have the fake news problem that we have right now, and what it has to do with the ways that we're automating and distributing authority, and using systems that make our lives easier and more convenient that might also be undermining the truth claims of traditional news. So the first trend is that authority is being replaced by authorization. So in the past, you needed to have a licensed expert you needed to have a judge. You needed to have an elected official if you wanted something to be done, if you wanted a transaction to be legitimated. But now, thanks to technology, we can use things like passwords. So if you want to see your bank records, you can see them yourself using a password. So that password authorizes you as a user to get access to those materials. You don't need to go through a gatekeeper. You don't need to go through a hierarchical authority figure. Authenticity is replaced by authentication. So rather than concern yourself personally with something that is, is it genuine, is it not, uh, you can rely on certain kinds of uh, procedural systems to decide if something is authentic through processes of authentication. So for example, if I want to use my smartphone, I can use my thumbprint to prove that it's me or I can hold up the camera of the phone and it can gather information about the biometrics of my face and that can say, yes, this is the genuine article. This is the real Liz Lash. She has been authenticated. Even though this is a non-human agent who's using a probabilistic algorithm to say it's me, it seems like that's a convenient thing to take advantage of. And finally, veracity is replaced by verification. So, how many of you, when you're not sure if something is true or not, Google it, right? You go to some third party site in order to establish its truth. And we can think about the, the roots of the word verification, the making of truth through these procedures, uh, the manufacture sometimes of truth through these procedures might be important to pay attention to. So I'm gonna quickly, uh, give you one example to walk you through these three steps. And then I'm gonna propose a couple of solutions. How many of you have heard of this story, Pizzagate? You might have at least heard this part of the story. You might have heard that on December 4th, 2016, Edgar Madison Welch, a 28-year-old man from Salisbury, North Carolina, uh, fired three shots in the Comet Ping Pong restaurant in Washington, DC, not very far from here with an AR-15 style rifle, striking walls, a desk, and a door. And this is the, on the right is the police report with the official complaint after Welch was taken into custody. 
Now, Welch had had some minor brushes with the law before, but he didn't really have a serious history of violence or political extremism. He's, but he was someone who was very new to the internet. He had just gotten broadband access in his house, and he was consuming fake news stories in, in a kind of feverish way. Um, and it seemed that he, he became so disordered by them that he wanted to investigate the potential source of these fake news stories in person. So let's, let's, let's see how Welch ended up in that pizza parlor. Well, the story actually started months and months and months before with um, the hacking of John Podesta's emails. And here, you can see how authority got replaced by authorization. Because Podesta shared his password with multiple people in his office. So many staffers had Podesta's emails. And I'm seeing uh, a computer scientist in the second row uh, shaking her head about that. But it was simply a matter of convenience, right? Podesta got so much email, and it needed to be sorted, and it needed to be responded to. It seemed like a, a something to do. However, when this email came in, a phishing email that claimed that his account had been compromised by Ukrainian hackers, it wasn't just a single authority figure making the decision about what to do. There were multiple people with his passport who a uh, password who contacted multiple IT experts and cybersecurity people. And of course, one of them said, yes, click on the email. It's genuine. And then all of the emails ended up at WikiLeaks. Another case where we can think about this displacement of authority by authorization. Right? The sources of material on Wikipedia, I'm sorry, on WikiLeaks are generally anonymous. Right? We don't have that traditional ethos that establishes the credibility of the source. Um, we have a bypassing of traditional gatekeepers. And indeed, material on Wikipedia is judged to be true without the context of the source based on an assumption that the content itself speaks for itself. So once those emails were out there, conspiracy theorists started to read them in a very odd way. And much like your computer looks for frequently mentioned terms, the term pizza jumped out at people. Now, if you've ever worked in a political campaign, the frequency of the word pizza in email is no mystery to you. But a particular Reddit user, dumb, scribbly, unctuous, suggested that there, uh, yes, that's his username. <laughs> or her username, we don't know, um, began to spread this idea that there was a secret code and that the, the emails could be decoded and that what the emails revealed when they were decoded, and there were actually other decoding efforts, one involving spirit cooking and all sorts of strange ideas, um, that if the emails were properly decoded using this dictionary, one would discover that there was a pattern of child abduction and abuse. And in searching for evidence to support this idea that there was a child exploitation ring tied to the Democratic Party, Reddit users focused on the Instagram account of James Elephantus, the owner of Comet Ping Pong Pizza, who was the former boyfriend of David Brock, who was an important member of campaign efforts for the Democratic Party. And it's interesting that these images were still out on the internet even after um, Alephantis made his Instagram account private. And one of the interesting things about how they were posted is they were very proudly posted with claims that they were there with blockchain technology. Um, so the distributed ledger system um, how many people here understand what blockchain is? Just a few people, right? But it sounds good. It sounds like it's been authenticated. Um, and so that claim became more powerful. Other internet uh, technologies that allowed upvoting, not only on Reddit, but sites like this, Vote, uh, propagated the Pizzagate conspiracy. And then we had people who claimed to have insider knowledge, who claimed that they had hacked into uh, the Comet Pizza 
um, website and discovered uh, all sorts of strange symbols there. And there were people who claimed to be members of law enforcement with insider information about unsolved cases. And the more and more bizarre these cases get, the more and more you might have been reminded of things like the blood libel, right? This, the, the stories from the Middle Ages where Jews were demonized uh, as supposed um, ritual abusers and st strange stories about satanic ritual abuse that were tied to the McMartin case in the 1980s and these other uh, cases that were later proved untrue. And so it might seem like these Pizzagate people were completely out to lunch. But remember, there had been a very recent sexual abuse ring case involving the Roman Catholic Church that initially sounded very bizarre that was later proven to be true. And people were, in fact, judged criminally culpable and convicted. And so these crazy cases might seem logical. So Pizzagate then get its, gets its own hashtag. It really goes viral. And we start seeing Pizzagate, even on non-right-wing paranoid sites, we start seeing Pizzagate on Pinterest. Pinterest, it's a place for crafts. It's a place for scrapbooking. It's not a place for Pizzagate. And then we have the final stage, which is thinking about how verification uh, replaces veracity. This is the Renegade Tribune, which promises to fact check the fact checking of the New York Times. But one of the things that's important to remember about the Pizzagate case is remember David Brock, that name I said before, the former boyfriend of James Elephantis, the Pizzagate, uh, I'm sorry, the Comet Pizza ping pong <coughs> owner? Well, David Brock also ran a fact checking site called Media Matters. And that fact checking site ran stories on Pizzagate. But because Brock was tied to Pizzagate, Media Matters was distrusted. And not only was Media Matters distrusted, but other fact-checking sites were distrusted. And in fact, if you went to David Brock's Wikipedia page, you might see that it's sort of strangely slanted. It talks about him as a political operative. It uses very negative language that would normally violate uh, Wikipedia's neutral point of view policies. But if you look at the talk page, the argument is it's all, we've followed our processes of verification, and as long as we followed our procedures, we don't have to do anything else. So one more piece when it comes to how veracity is replaced by verification. After the Comet Ping Pong shooting, people Googled Edgar Madison Welsh's name, and they came to his IMDb page. Because Welch was also an aspiring actor. He had had minor roles in a couple of independent films. And Pizzagate conspiracy theorists decided he was a crisis actor, that he didn't really believe in Pizzagate, but he had simply gone there as a paid actor in order to try to propagate gun control. Solutions, well, I have a couple. This will be fast, though. The first solution is technology companies created the problem. Let's let them create the solution. Right? Facebook is offering to uh, use better AI in order to spot um, fake news stories. It's um, developed this system where you can flag a fake news story uh, using crowdsourcing. Um, and that seems promising. It seems like something they should do. Uh, Twitter uh, has the blue check mark to verify uh, actual users. Of course, uh, Richard Spencer, the white nationalist behind Charlotte's, the Charlottesville uh, debacle, was uh, one of the first people to got a, get a blue check mark. So um, I, I don't know how well that speaks for uh, Twitter's solution. But as my colleague Siva Vadyanathan at the University of Virginia, Virginia points out, the big problem is that Social network sites have no financial incentive to control fake news. They profit from fake news. And in fact, if you look at this graph that was created by researchers at NYU and Stanford working together in a team setting fake news, what you see is you see more total engagement with fake news stories rather than with real news stories. In other words, the 
the profit model of a social network sites depends on two things, targeted advertising and harvesting data. And that means that a fake news story gives them more information that they can profit from than a real news story. At the same time, fact-checking sites are struggling financially. They have no profit model. Look at Snopes.com. I, I mean, yes, there was a messy divorce. Yes, there was a bad corporate takeover. Uh, yes, their GoFundMe page is embarrassing. <laughs> but, you know, how are you going to make money off fact-checking? OK, so let's say the technology companies can't regulate themselves. Should the government regulate them? Well, that's dead in the water. And part of the reason it's dead in the water is because uh, fake news is seen as a partisan issue. So uh, when every time a Democratic legislator introduces a, a bill having to do with fake news, it does not go anywhere. Now, there's been a lot more movement in Europe. If you look at the House of Commons, if you look at the EU, there's been a lot of progress on the regulatory front, not only on fake news, but on privacy issues in general. And that seems promising. But a lot of people would say Europe is not the United States. We have different attitudes about free speech. We have different attitudes about censorship. It wouldn't be appropriate for us to take that regulatory path. Well, there's something else that I think Europe is doing that we should pay attention to, and that's media literacy. If you look at media literacy, and particularly news literacy, uh, curricula in Europe, they're really far superior to those in the United States. And if you look at countries like Germany or the Netherlands, you see that there's a really rigorous attempt to um, educate young people about fake news early and often. And there's a lot of research that could support those curricula. Right, you look at the Center for Internet and Society, uh, the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at um, Harvard University. You look at the Media Manipulation Unit at Data and Society. There's a lot of great research that could go into media literacy curricula. But as those researchers in the science study said, solving fake news will involve, needs to involve an interdisciplinary approach. So I would close with a plea for funding the humanities because the humanities really are critical for identifying fake news. It's really useful to know something about history. It's useful to know something about context. It's useful to know something about rhetoric. It's useful to know philosophy so that you can critically analyze arguments. And it's useful to know foreign languages because many fake news stories travel because people do not speak the languages that are depicted in the fake news content. So this is a time that, uh, this would be my sort of rallying cry to support the humanities. And with that, I welcome your questions. Um, we have folks from the Equality Lab, which is our fantastic space for digital uh, scholarship here at William & Mary. Uh, if you're an Equality Lab person, would you please stand up? And I encourage you to visit our symposium on gender and technology on November 2nd, because um, there's a lot of great stuff happening with the Equality Lab. So with that, uh, I welcome your questions. Hi, uh, we have, oops, it doesn't seem like it's on. Is it? Okay. Um, we have a question from the social media community that asks, what is the role of the hashtag in the proliferation of fake news on social media? If we got rid of hashtags, would that slow down the spread of fake news? Well, it's a good question because I'm currently working on a book thinking about the hashtag as a cultural object. And I would argue that as a tool for aggregating information, hashtags are really important as a way for people to find particular conversations, particularly political conversations, that can be really important for activism and social movements. So I wouldn't want to get rid of hashtags anytime soon. But what I do think is uh, the problem with something like Pizzagate is it's lazy hashtagging. So one of the things I talk about in the book is different techniques that activists use to identify content with metadata using a hashtag. And often they'll use the name of a person or a geographical location 
or a slogan. So in the case of the Black Lives Matter movement, using Mike Brown, using Ferguson, and using Black Lives Matter as hashtags has been really important in energizing activists. But coming up with those hashtag slogan usually takes a lot of time, like any naming convention, and a lot of discussion, deliberation, and, and meaningful conversation. Uh, just adding the word gate to something is pretty lazy, but it establishes that something is scandalous, something is new, and so we see a lot of these gate hashtags that, that are designed to um, generate outrage um, and clicks um, without a lot of critical thought. Good question, though. Other questions? A question over there? <laughs> oh, sorry, she has to hold it. Uh, have you um, heard of the sort of rampant labeling of news addiction at all? No, although, I mean, certainly there's a broader concern with internet addiction, and you see all sorts of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, interventions imagined. Um, I'm always concerned with medicalization because I think there's a tendency for cultural and social problems to be reduced to something that can merely be treated as a medical condition rather than examining the social and cultural factors that might be producing the unhappiness. Um, so if someone is unhappy about news consumption, uh, I'm not sure it really rises to the level of an addiction. Uh, it is interesting, so I have been following the columnist for the New York Times who says that uh, they're gonna re re renounce getting news from the internet and only get news from newspapers. That seems like an, uh, an admirable experiment, um, but I don't think that talking about addiction is really productive. Good question, though, and certainly sometimes I feel a little addicted, but. Okay, and I think we have a question back there, and then if we could get a microphone runner up here, too. Right here. Okay. So yes. in terms of, um, you know, you're taking, like, fake news is obviously a serious thing, but are you taking it a little too seriously in terms of, because you know people on 4chan are just strolling and they love every time one of the 4chan stories is picked up by the you know, mainstream media. So is, are, we, are, we taking a little, are we taking it a little too far and just you know, not realizing it's someone trolling us? Uh, so, I mean, I certainly think that one thing that's interesting about uh, sites like 4chan, 8chan, and Anonymous is this sort of for the lulls culture Right, where you're, this is something that the internet researcher Gabrielle Colbin has talked about, is uh, she's interested in how even incredibly malicious activity can be treated as humorous in certain online groups. And, and I get the accusations that people take fake news too seriously. Um, but I would argue that it has affected our democracy because if you assume that all news is partisan, it becomes much more difficult for us to have conversations where we have a shared reality. And I, 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 think, I think the kind of undermining of reality that humor does is important as cultural work, but I also think it's important to not undermine reality to an extent to which there, you know, we're debating things like climate change. Let me ask a question about intentionality, although it may make no difference whatsoever. That soccer um, satire was a poorly made version of what SNL would come up with. But SNL comes up with really great things, and I doubt if any um, a program is going to take SNL and turn that into fake news, because it's satire. Mm -hmm. And it's very clever satire and very funny satire. So my question is, the soccer um, video was not fake news to begin with. It was satire. Right. Once the Canadian broadcasting system picked it up, it became fake news. 
and especially because people started to, to believe it. The, the major question, I think, it's, it's, you're right about media literacy. It's also training people to be critical of the entire consumerist society of America. Advertising, for example. I, I work a lot in perfume advertising. You believe in perfume advertising, you believe that that bottle will give you love, will give you whatever <laughs> you want. There's even a perfume called Furamone, which is advertised in the back pages of uh, the New York Review of Books. There's never been a synthetic creation of a pheromone that will basically cause somebody else to fall in love with you. So th the question here is criticism, being critical, learning, that's why Baudrillard is so important, learning that there are um, um, ideologies out there that are controlling you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't accept that, and if you don't have this critical consciousness, you're really going to become um, prey to things that uh, you basically start believing in. I don't mean to suggest that um, America has been dumb, dumbed down by a, a whole host of things, but I think in some respects the educational system of this country has not, humanities are really important, has not brought in the kind of hermeneutics of suspicion that were, were, has been important in French and German theorists from the 1970s all the way to the, the beginning of the 21st century. Yeah, I, I, and, and I also think that there are uh, institutional factors that make better media literacy hard to do in the United States right now, just in the post No Child Left Behind era. Um, so much of K through 12 education is about teaching to the test that it's really difficult to take time out for these kinds of complicated questions that don't necessarily fit into that kind of multiple choice um, uh, rubric. So. I, I think, um, can you all hear me in this with my raspy voice? I loved your presentation, and it certainly explained a lot to us that many of us didn't understand. But there's another part of fake news that you're aware of um, that we all ought to be um, cognizant of, that it serves a very good purpose. Think of World War II when fake news specifically aided the Allies in, in Normandy as to where the, um, uh, the battle was going to be fought with Patton's army um, that didn't exist. So it served a great purpose in saving allied and especially American lives. And that ought to be brought up that all fake news is not bad. Yeah, and I, I, but I would argue that that assumes a kind of information warfare or disinformation warfare mentality. Um, and that is, a, that is a mentality for times of war. I'm not sure it's, it's a mentality for times of peace but it is a legitimate point. Loose lips, ship. Quick ships, yeah. Okay, and we've got some people in the front. And... So um, thank you for this amazing talk, Liz. I have a question that has to do with class, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you can address the question of class, because I'm thinking about populism, I'm thinking about the um, suspicious way in which intellectuals, education, um, university educated um, politicians, for example, are discussed. Um, and, and what role, how do we talk across class divides mm -hmm. about fake news? Because I'm not sure, yes, advocate, advocate for media literacy, advocate for the humanities, absolutely. But how do we talk across class um, about this problem. Is there anything that you could um, offer in terms of that? That's a very difficult problem because, of course, America is in denial about its uh, class issues. Uh, when they survey Americans, most Americans by like over 90% identify as middle class. And so there's this perception that we share as shared class reality. Um, I would say it's something, I'd like to say something really nice about Fox News, which is that Fox News actually does a much better job covering the lives of people in the military um, than uh, sort of more uh, liberal uh, uh, broadcast organizations. Um, and that is important because we are sending people into combat and um, having news content that is about their lives matters. Um, and so I would say that, that the sense that more elite media aren't concerned 
with the fact that many people are in the armed forces is a problem. Um, and I, I think that the assumption that people who are not of elite classes are media illiterate is a very troubling assumption. And it's not one I would ever make in 10 million years. Um, because I think that there, as, if, if fake news cuts across uh, partisan politics and occurs across the political spectrum, fake news occurs across the class spectrum as well. Um, and there are certainly uh, people of very elite classes who have uh, fallen for uh, dramatically fake news. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, I was struck when you were talking about your three categories, the veracity, verification, authority, authorization, that what you're talking about on sort of the left-hand column are things more personal related to individual people and what you're talking about in the right-hand column are things that are far more impersonal, related more to, um, I guess, machines in a way, mm -hmm. that then provide the, the basis for the information. And in that context, it occurred to me that you could take looking for fake news even further back to Socrates, mm -hmm. okay? So that what you're looking at is the invention of we're going to pass teachings on not through a teacher whom we understand and respect and know personally to um, uh, something that's written down. I mean, right. that's why Socrates did not want his teachings written down. He wanted people to hear them from himself. And it seems to me that that's part of the problem that we're dealing with, is that our sources of information have become so depersonalized, and sometimes deliberately so, where people uh, fake being other people providing the information. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about that issue of personalization versus depersonalization. I think that's certainly a, an important one. And certainly, you know, I talked about media technologies and anxieties about fake news. Um, Plato exp expresses all of this anxiety about writing as a technology and the ways that once you have um, someone who can hide their identity behind a piece of writing uh, and you no longer are sure of the original source, there are all sorts of possibilities for fiction and untruth and falsehood. Um, so I might say that the, the interesting thing to me is a legal one. And, I, and rather than going back to the classical era as much as I'd love to, um, I think it's interesting to think about how our legal system, which is based in English common law, is grounded fundamentally on the idea of testimony, specifically eyewitness testimony. Um, and what we're seeing, and so it's actually very difficult, or it used to be, to convict someone using evidence. Right? You could only convict someone with testimony, you couldn't convict them with evidence. So if you wanted to convict them with evidence, you needed a, uh, an expert witness to provide testimony in order to do so. Now, what's happening is that uh, we are, in terms of our legal system, we're now more likely to accept um, sources of truth that aren't necessarily based on eyewitness testimony. Um, and I would say that's a, a kind of broader movement uh, as we embrace technologies uh, that make it much uh, easier to bypass the level of, the, of human perception and judgment. And one of the projects that I'm working on uh, with my colleague uh, Jill Walker Retberg at the University of Bergen, um, and um, thank you for, uh, to William and Mary for funding my research, is thinking about this relationship between machine vision and the humanities. Because right now, at our specific moment, more words and images are read by machines than by human beings. Right? That is the world we are in, not in some futuristic world. That's today. Um, and that's a significant change when the primary agent who is examining cultural products like words and images and music, music that agent is a non-human agent. And we are living in a world of smart agents who are non-human. And that's changing our world. Good question. Deborah? Um, my question really um, follows, I think, from um, you're going back to English common law and the idea of testimony. Um, in that I've been thinking a great deal, as I'm sure we all have, 
about the news with Cambridge Analytica um, in relation to Facebook and thinking about um, what can we do to affect such an enormous um, agency in our lives, right, this huge corporation. Um, do we uh, in some way uh, take some kind of individual act of protest and citizenship and just quit Facebook? I mean, is mm -hmm. that going to do anything? Is that, do we um, instead put our bodies out on the street as many of us, I'm sure, are going to do on Saturday in support of um, the students, right, who are trying to fight for some kind of uh, reasonable gun control. I think these things are very much related. I think we're um, struggling for a mode of testimony mm -hmm. to go back to. I mean, I really, I know you weren't using that term in, in precisely that way, but because I think, you know, we are struggling to try to figure out what can we actually do, what kind of political action can we take, right? in um, our, our search, our yearning for a, a kind of truth, right? Feeling that we want to somehow have a more truthful relation with one another um, and, you know, with um, society as a whole. And so I guess my, my question is really, you know, what kind of political action? I mean, I love the things people have been saying and, you know, the idea that we need to be able to discern more closely and more precisely and more deeply um, that we need to critique in the way that Richard was saying, right? But I somehow feel there must be um, some kind of action that is uh, something we can do both individually and um, in aggregation as, as political protest. So Judith Butler has written a lot about the question of the power of bodies in the street. Right, the importance of that uh, assembly of bodies in physical space, um, occupying public space in the concrete world with physical bodies. Um, I agree that uh, protest in the face-to-face -face context is critical for our democracy, but I also think that it's important not to disallow the importance of online participation as well. I think that people often have important experiences of co-presence with people who are participating in marches and protests. And I know that people mock selfies, um, but actually people who, who take selfies of themselves at protests and then share them with their um, social networks are performing an act of political solidarity with those who could not be present. And I think that um, Co-presence is something that is very important to us in our lives. Um, how many of you have heard about someone's death through a social network site? Um, if I ask that question a few years from now, I suspect that every hand would go up. So that, that co-presence, that sense that we do have a shared reality is important. And some of how people get that is through social network sites. Um, and even my friend and colleague, Siva Vajinathan, is not quitting Facebook. And he's writing the, this, this great book, The Anti-Social Network, that I recommend that you all go out and buy, because it's really about how incredibly evil uh, Facebook is. <laughs> but, you know, he's not quitting Facebook uh, either. Um, however, the Cambridge Analytica case is very disturbing. But it's not disturbing, really, for the reason that people necessarily assume it's disturbing. So, um, for example, it did not, it seems, influence the election much because the great trove of data that the Trump campaign had access to, they were too cheap to actually spend the money to analyze the data. So even though these profiles were developed, they weren't operationalized. But the sort of larger pattern of profiling is a really significant one. I think. I personally think that the, if we push for stronger privacy, privacy laws in the United States that are more like the laws in Europe, I think that would be a good first step uh, against things like the Cambridge Analytica uh, debacle. We have one more question, I think it's up here. Um, you mentioned artificial intelligence earlier as a facilitator of fake news and the predominance of 
non-human review of literature and images. Is there a positive role for artificial intelligence in combating fake news as opposed to facilitating it? Um, I think that there is some uh, positive role. And I'm actually part of a group that's, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the Association for Computational Linguistics, has a special group a workshop that looks at the issue of uh, online uh, hate and uh, specifically uh, sustained harassment that's misogynistic, homophobic, uh, or racist. Um, and they are, I think there are well-intentioned computer scientists working on that problem, just as there are well-intentioned computer scientists working on the Facebook problem. Um, I think that actually artificial intelligence can do a lot of other things, too. Uh, AI uh, systems are being used more and more to actually write the news. Now, that might sound terrible, um, but for local news, um, when local news organizations are being decimated, um, to have local sports or um, public meetings uh, written about um, by bots to, who produce digestible stories that people can read and try to understand something about what's happening in their communities, um, I actually think that's a, a good use of automated systems. Um, so the, I think that it is, uh, I, I, I think the problem isn't just technology. I think the problem is culture. And, I, you know, and that's the argument that I've made about online misogyny, online racism, and online homophobia, too. It's, it's not just about a technological problem. It's a cultural problem. Um, and I think fake news is also a cultural problem. Thank you. Thank you. That was very genuine, not fake. <laughs> uh, two announcements. These two lovely items for a very modest cost can be obtained <laughs> right outside. Uh, also, whether you go outside and buy the books or not, I highly recommend them. Uh, upstairs is our reception where we will get to continue this conversation. And thank you for what has been an extremely elegant and stimulating talk. Thank oh, you. thank you so much.